Welcome to our session tonight on accessing accommodations for the SAT or the ACT. My name is Kevin Organicek. I'm the founder of TPAPT. We are a national association of local independent tutors, IECs, and test prep professionals. And we are joined today by Michael Mannion. Michael has over two decades of experience as an academic coach and has worked with students of varying degrees of neurodivergence over that time. And he's also an advocate for accommodations. And Michael, we're pleased to have you. And thank you so much for sharing what you know about this process with us. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. I think we all know a little bit. Um, I'm just glad to be here. And, you know, I got all dressed up today to, to present to you this, uh, this I think, really important information uh, about what's what's possible. Uh, I used to own a really old car and uh, used to work on it maybe almost every week. And, and one of the things that was tricky for me as a sort of a novice or like an amateur mechanic was just knowing what tools were available to me. Um, and I think that that really speaks to what we're going to talk about today. So we're here to talk about accessing accommodations for the SAT and the ACT. Um, here in Colorado, there is a strong leaning toward the SAT, and that kind of has to do with contractual stuff for the state of Colorado and uh, their arrangements with SAT. But I don't want to diminish uh, the benefits of the ACT test. And we're not necessarily here to talk about the differences between those tests. And Kevin and his organization, I think, would be a great resource to go deeper into that conversation. We will touch briefly on uh, some upcoming changes and how they might impact accommodations and how they're presented and that kind of thing. But we're gonna do my best to, to kind of stay, uh, stay on a track that you can easily follow. And Kevin's here to help sort of ask questions and guide us along if, um, you know, if, if, I, if I start to slide. But um, once again, really happy to be here. My name's uh, Michael John Mannion, and I work with students in uh, accessing uh, accommodations through mostly 504 and IEP staffings that happen um, in, uh, in the school setting. So let's uh, make sure everybody's here, and they are. So let's, let's see if we can move on here. Um, I'm gonna hit the next slide. Okay. So let's get started. So the, this workshop is beginning right here. And uh, whether you're here with us live or whether you're, you're watching this uh, recorded, we're, we sure are really glad that you're here. And um, I think first, if you've never, uh, you, know, you know, attended one of our workshops before, if you've never um, been involved with uh, TPAPT, um, this is probably a, a great place to start. And just know that there's an awful lot of resources available to you uh, through both organizations. So uh, just a little bit about me. Um, I, I just, I took my bio and it was so long. <laughs> so what I did was uh, I hyperlinked it to this page. If you're really interested in my whole story, um, you can read it. I was gonna put it in really fine print to be sarcastic, but I'll just give you some highlights. Uh, I grew up with, uh, as the eldest of, grand, of all, the, all the grandchildren. So I was always sort of like seated at the kids table, even like until I was in my twenties. Um, when I was in high school, I was the mascot. And, um, and so, uh, what, what that meant was I got to dress up in a lion costume for pretty much every athletic event at my high school. Um, and um, from there, just got to, just give you an idea of the kind of spirit I have, you know, um, from there, I, I got involved in behavior management uh, counseling and I was working with um, a, a brand new group home that had opened in Pennsylvania that just happened to be about, uh, happened to be about a block away from my college dorm. And so um, that's where things really started to, to take direction for me in regard to the work that I do today. I um, became a director at Camp Joy. I think Jazz is on the call with us right now. And both Jazz and I directed Camp Joy in Pennsylvania. And that was a camp for multiply handicapped adults and children. And we, we provided them a summer camp experience where they otherwise would not have had that. Um, did that for about seven, seven years. Uh, then I became a teacher for the Delaware County Intermediate Unit where I worked with multiple handicapped class. From there, I moved on and became a case manager for a school district just outside of Philadelphia. And um, shortly after that, I moved to San Francisco and taught um, at a middle school class there. And I was there for several years. And that was a life-changing experience for me, for sure. Um, from there, I found myself here in Boulder and became part of the leadership team for the CHOICE program at Boulder Valley School District. 
um, founded Just2 Tutoring, and um, he just here recently, we're rebranded as Just2 Educational Services. So um, probably not fascinating bio, but a bio nonetheless. So we'll move along, if you don't mind. All right, so here's kind of the, you know what we're going to talk about today. I uh, just want to briefly touch on the recent changes to SAT, especially in the ways that they um, that they speak to accommodations. Uh, we're going to talk about how to access those SAT and ACT testing accommodations. That's why you're here, so we're definitely going to spend some time on that. And we want to talk about the criteria. You know, how does one qualify? And I think sometimes for for some of us. We don't um, always want to know, um, you know, how to get a fish. When I maybe know how, how to how to fish, how to go get my own fish. Um, so that's the kind of thing. I want to give you some background on how all this stuff works. Um, we're gonna go a little bit uh, into the types of accommodations. Well, let's be honest. For the most part, we're all here to talk about extended time. Really, I mean that is the uh, that is the the um, most common accommodation request. And I would guess that that's probably the one that you're here to hear mostly about. So we're going to focus primarily on those, but I want to let you know what other accommodations are available. And then I want to just talk briefly about accommodation implementation in preparation and during the test. And I'm only just going to touch on that lightly because it, it occurred to me, Kevin, that this is actually a really good topic for us to spend an hour discussing. So I'm just going to lightly touch upon it and just say we will schedule that, that um, a deeper dive into that topic um, at another time, right? But very, very soon, probably. All right. Just let people in here. All right. If you just arrived, thank you so much for being here. We're uh, talking about accessing accommodations for the SAT uh, and the ACT. As mentioned earlier, Kevin and his organization have a great deal of, uh, of, of up-to-date information about recent changes, especially in the SAT. And of course, um, you know, performing at your very best for the ACT. So if you're interested in getting some support around that, definitely talk with Kevin uh, about that. Um, in the meantime, let me just talk, touch on a couple of a couple of things that I've gleaned um, in terms of what's new and what's not new. So both the ACT and SAT now offer online versions. That might be news to you, or you might have heard that that was coming, but like just as this month, I think there's just as uh, March, uh, I think it was March, where um, all this started to launch, or maybe in January for the uh, for one of them. Nonetheless, at this time, we've already crossed the threshold. SAT won't even offer a paper pencil test anymore. So you have to take a, a, the online version as I understand. Kevin, correct me if you, if you know other uh, otherwise. Well, actually, uh, I think if you request the accommodation to take it pencil and paper, you still can do that, yes. They will, they will uh, uh, honor that. Okay, that's great to hear. Um, so I have uh, just a, a couple of links here in terms of what to bring. And you know, generally speaking, maybe that was a no brainer in the past, but there's a couple of things that you might wanna consider in regard to the what to bring. So maybe I'll just touch on that for just a minute, but let me just um, tell you what's not new. Um, you still have to go to an actual testing accommodation center. And I think for a lot of people that they might be confused by the idea that the test is online. So they might presume you could take it you know, from home, that kind of thing. They still want you to show up at a testing center. I'm sorry if that's obvious to everybody here, but it wasn't to me. So I thought I'd share that with you, All right? And that accommodations are, are, you know, continue to be available. That's not new, that hasn't changed at all. Um, some other things that are new though, like I said, uh, just see if I can touch on this, what to bring things I get to that for us. I, I will be bouncing around to, um, probably the college board sites quite a bit today. Um, nonetheless, I've brought everything together for you in this little slide deck. So what to bring on SAT test day, all right? So a couple of things that you know might not be obvious to you. Um, I've had students show up for the test and forget their ID, and that's obviously a problem. Um, and that's that hasn't changed a bit. But, the, but this part has changed. They want you to bring your own device to the test. Uh, again, I'm gonna make sure that that's um, really clear for again for some of you guys. You might already known that, but um, I did not. They even suggest that you bring an extra device just in case your device fails. And both devices should have what's called the Blue Book application preloaded. So I think that's an important part um, to understand. Um, there will be a calculator available, by the way, on the math section it, it's, it's it's all plugged into the system but for some of us we like to bring our own calculator and that's still of course acceptable all right i won't go into much more detail here necessarily but do keep in mind that having a watch 
And um, my, my mentor, he has to dig through your, you know, your mom's or your dad's drawer and see if you can find an old analog watch that you can, you know, you, that you can set and that has no beeping alarms or that sort of thing, you know, um, those are ideal for this. I, and I'll say that the reason for that is that occasionally you might find yourself, a student might find themselves seated in the room in just a position that might be hard for them to see the clock. Um, so it could be really helpful to, to bring that along. All right. So I will move us back to, let's see if I can get us back here right now. Um, all right, and then this blue book testing application, I mentioned that just a minute ago. Um, that's something that's gonna be really important to, uh, you know, to understand that that's, that's a new development. All right, let's move on to uh, our next slide. Oh, by the way, if you're here and you have any questions or if I'm not making any sense, just let me know. We'll, we'll try to that'll clear that up, okay? Um, how to access your SAT or ACT accommodations. Now, for many of us, uh, many students, they've already been identified, and the process will kind of take its own course, uh, presuming that um, your, your student is enrolled at a school where there's a special education department and there's a counseling department. Generally, the school counselor or the case manager at the school, the special ed teacher, will handle the accommodations or the request for accommodations. So those of you who are in that sort of setting, you can pretty much be rest assured that those accommodations are going to be arranged. Now, I've also been in situations where um, I've... Um, confirmed, let's say I was kind of verifying with a teacher or a counselor or that the accommodations were in place. And their response to me was a little bit shocking. And it was something to the effect of, we'll do that in the spring, but we're gonna let them just try the test without accommodations for the fall. That to me seems like some gray area at best, right? So if you know your young person is eligible for accommodations, currently in the classroom, you probably just want to get an email off to the counselor to confirm that that's going to happen. Now, let's say you, you have your, your young person has not been identified, and you suspect that this could be a really, you know, um, uh, applicable situation for them. So, and you're coming up on the test and you're thinking about, well, maybe, uh, maybe we should look into this and see if, um, if our young person could be eligible for accommodations according to SAT and, and ACT. So there's a couple of things that you could do. You could certainly, again, contact your counselor and you could talk, or you could talk with teachers. You may already be aware because you know, you're know your parents and you know everything about your kid for the most part. You might already be aware that maybe teachers are already providing extra time in the classroom. If they are, that's great evidence to, you know, to present in, in terms of your request. So what you might wanna do then is to, ask your school counselor to support you in that request for accommodations based on the fact that they're already having extra time in the classroom. Um, if that's not the case, maybe um, your young person is maybe only just recently or maybe post COVID started to sort of um, you know, show some indication that it might be you know, necessary for them to get a little bit more support at school. The most, ex, you know, I think I don't know if I, I don't want to misuse the word, but the the most the, most, the quickest way to um, to secure your accommodations is to consult with a private clinician. Now, a lot of times these services are not covered by insurance or that sort of thing, and that's where things can get a little bit um, you know not so cost effective. Let's just say, right? So, consulting with a private con cl clinician could be uh, you know could be up to like a four to six week turnaround. Uh, which might sound like a lot of time, but comparatively, it's not. Uh, so maybe you'd make a call and you could get in to see the clinician within the next two to three weeks, and they might have a report ready for you within four to six, right? That's a pretty tight timeline. That's the kind of, you know, kind of situation. So I want to make that really clear too. The majority of, um, of requests for accommodations, at least formally within the school, can take some time. So if you're getting ready for a test, um, in the very near future, you may or may not be able to land those accommodations effectively. But Kevin and I were just talking as we got started today, and um, he confirmed, uh, Kevin, you confirmed that um, that College Board needs a 10-day lead time at minimum in order to-, um, to No, that's ACT. ACT. Needs, uh, 10 days to consider your application and the application has to be submitted by the um, school official, by the, late registration deadline and yep. SAT is more like six weeks so 
Right. Okay. On top of the six weeks it may take that you're describing here for the actual accommodation to be approved by a medical professional, it sort of, you know, we're backing out now three months from a prospective test date. So your point right. is a good one. Right. And, it, and so what you might consider is that maybe your young person is going to take the SAT here in Colorado without accommodations in the spring, maybe as um, as required by their school. Uh, but potentially by the fall, we could have a situation where, uh, where that could be drastically different in regard to those accommodations. Um, also, I want to mention maybe like sort of leaning back to the previous slide. Uh, one of the sort of interesting uh, developments of the online version of both of these tests is that the accommodations are built in, um, meaning that um, I want to make this really clear too. When you're, uh, if you were to interact with the practice tests uh, that uh, inside the uh, SAT format or the, inside their their suite of assessments, for example, um, you'll find that when you finish a section, you can easily click to the next section. Well, that won't be the case for our, for our young people, regardless of whether they have accommodations or not. They cannot move on to the next section until the time has expired. And that will be even more regulated than it ever has been because of the, uh, the online format of, of the test itself. So those of us who have extended time, that's not that different, right? You still had to stay in the room for your time and a half. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. And all that, will, again, will be regulated by uh, the online version. If you need large print, again, that will be accommodated by, uh, um, you know, uh, by this online version. But let's talk more about, again, accessing testing accommodations. For, for a lot of people, especially here in, in Colorado, sometimes we'll look to universities uh, or community services, community resources, in order to access what I described um, would happen in more a, cl a clinician, a clinical setting. Um, the cost will be significantly less, not it won't be cheap, but it'll be significantly less uh, in a setting such as like the CU psych and neuropsych clinic um, where um, a family can sign up for services and receive the same kind of report, a neuropsych report, which would oftentimes shed light on a student's need for school accommodations. Um, the wait time on these community resources are, are traditionally, they could be six months to a year before they could see you. So this is um, one of the, obviously, the drawbacks. And the final thing I just want to mention around this is, is don't forget to talk, just talk to your regular old doctor. Mention it to your GP. I don't know everything. You may have an insurance um, program, a health insurance program that could cover these kinds of, um, you know, these kinds of evaluations. So just, it's just important to sort of exhaust your, your resources, but I always start with your school counselor, you know, your, your point person at the school, I think is, is the best way to go. If you happen to be a homeschool kind of family, again, I would, I, I would direct you back to your GP and see if you can get some referrals through, uh, through hopefully your, your own family healthcare. All right, if not, look into those community resources. This would be a great time to stop and ask questions <laughs> or and answer any questions people would have. Um, so I'm going to just pause for just a minute and give you a chance to maybe think about whether or not you have any questions. Um, I'm curious, you know, in terms of what you're thinking, whether, again, whether you're live with us right now or you're watching the recorded version, if you're thinking, I pretty much knew that or I didn't know that. I'd be curious to know about that. Uh, get your feedback. So how to access SAT and ACT testing accommodations is the next thing to, um, to talk about. And, um, you, you know, um, I wanted to just be clear. What I was talking about before is how to access accommodations within your school setting. And, and that is often a pathway to accessing accommodations within the test, right? So we're here to talk really about the SAT and ACT. So that's why I wanna circle back once again to your contact your school counselor. And I wanna stress it one more time. If you know that your young person is, um, is eligible for accommodations because they have an active 504 or an IEP, I would highly recommend you just verify with those point people that those accommodations are gonna happen for the upcoming SAT, PSAT or ACT test. Right, so just, I would just encourage you to do that. If you're taking the test outside of the school, for example, you take it on a Saturday, you know, that kind of thing. Again, talk to your school counselor about supporting you in that. They'll, they can they can support you in getting those accommodations set up, even if 
you're not taking the school, uh, sorry, you're not taking the test at school. And I, if I'm not making any sense, let me just clarify. In the state of Colorado, every April, by contract and by law, all juniors must take the SAT. It's part of their graduation requirements. It's all sort of roped into that. Um, the same thing is true for our uh, younger kids who will take the PSATs. Um, so just to make that really clear. So, and that will happen for every high school student in the state of Colorado for free in school, right? They'll have a, you know, they'll have a, an adjusted school day schedule. I'm not sure if that's happening where you live or not, um, but I, that's the context that I'm coming from. If that makes sense. All right. So as I was putting this slide together, I came across this website and I just had to sh share this with you. Hey, uh, Jess, do you have a question or you want to share something? Sure. Hi, everyone. I know that uh, many parents ask us, um, do we have to show that we're using our accommodations in order to get approved for use on the test? So just in the day-to-day the -day school um, access of accommodations, how do we show that? And does that meet the requirements? That's a great question. I consulted with Stephen Solis, who's a behavior specialist at Boulder High School uh, in Boulder, Colorado, just yesterday on this topic. And what he said is that just there is, as far as he knows, there's not as much emphasis, again, on the duration of the use of these accommodations, just that there's evidence that they're in place. And okay. what that basically looks like is the counselor sends out an email or a form to, uh, to the teaching staff and ask them just to verify that they are indeed using as for example, extended time in the classroom to support their students and you know, performing at their best. Uh, but there doesn't have to be this evidence or like, you know, had to be like this hard, fast uh, start date of six months prior, as far as I understand. So there's more of a qualitative use to it versus uh, cut and dry requirement. Yep. Okay, that sounds great. And it, you know, and it's somewhat, um, is it, I guess it's somewhat subjective in the sense that, you know, it's, it's your, you know, your teacher's verifying. It's not mom or dad saying, you know, I, I you know. I, right. I so what I'm hearing is, um, and parents ask this often too, is does my, does my kid need to self-advocate or, you know, use, use their accommodations? It sounds like there needs to be definitely use of or, or some established um, use of, right, um, of it, and then that gets uh, documented. Is that right? That, absolutely. Yeah. And, yeah. and why you're, you're asking that question, Jazz, it sort of sparks a thought. It's something I, I speak just lightly about in the blog um, on the same topic is just the notion that, you know, parents, I'm just going to give you a heads up. You can go to a lot of trouble to land these accommodations for your young person. Um, you can go through the evaluation process. You can set up these accommodations at school. Your young person could arrive at the testing center on some Saturday morning, perhaps got a ride with some friends, discover that they might be shoveled off to another, shuffled off to another room, and in that moment, waive their accommodations. Just a heads up on that. I think it's just really important for parents to understand that our students do have the right to waive their accommodation. And if you don't want that to happen, I think it's just important we have that conversation with, with your kids. There, there, there could be just a moment of social stigma, let's just say, um, depending, just depending on how the registration table is handled when the kids arrive, that could impact the kid's choice whether or not to, they're going to use this accommodation. So thanks for bringing that up, Jess. I, um, I know I wasn't directly related to your question, but I no, that's yeah there these things can happen and to be aware of them you know that's why we're here to bring forth the information and working with so many parents who have you know high schoolers who have extra time get to have a quiet space use earphones you know headphones um uh get to request notes like that kind of stuff these are all you know typical accommodations you know front row seating or different preferential seating that type of stuff these accommodations work in the day to day, but what we hear from parents is that when it comes to test taking, like this bigger test, um, a lot of times their their student is their kid is uh, they get anxious ahead of time, right? And so they'll or they're kind of a people pleaser anyway, and so when they show up to the test, they're just they're just going with the flow and they're not self advocating, so um, or they don't know what their rights are or how accommodations work at the test prep site um, or even in the classroom. So 
that's what Just Two is here for, is to help parents help their their young person understand, you know, what's available to them and how to use that uh, and, and to create that level playing field. So test in the test prep arena, you know, as we're prepping for it and when we're taking the tests and where we're getting the results, you know, here at Just Two, we're with you all the way. Right on. And I would also just add that, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, there's accommodations for the test itself, right? There's also accommodating our kids. And we mentioned it earlier, you know, um, just supporting our kids and making sure they have their ID and their, their water and a calculator and their ticket, right? Uh, you know, to make sure that that stuff makes it to the car with them or, you know, it makes it to the registration table. All this stuff is important. Helping our kids understand that uh, or to verify the location of the testing center. It, you know, now again, we're talking about specific testing accommodations in terms of uh, specifically uh, time extensions. But I, but I think Jazz and I are just segueing into just how do we support our kids to be fully prepared? You know, might realize that they thought that the test was at their local high school and it just is not. It's across town somewhere, right? And so the timing is going to be all off. Um, at Fairview High School here, one of our local high schools, if you can't find a spot in the parking lot, you have to park up in, in the residence area and it could be a, a 45 minute walk from where you park to the door. It's that kind of planning that also helps accommodate our kids and to having not just a successful testing experience, but just showing up in a way that's calm and centered. And that's a big part of, of, of a success formula. So I appreciate that. Um, I just wanted to just uh, you know direct you to this particular site that I, that I came across, understood.org, they um, have a really great layout in terms of how to access the SAT or ACT. I'm obviously not going to um, read this to you, but I wanted to make sure that you get this, you know, that I direct you to this resource. It's, you know, it's a great layout and really just gives you um, a, a difference in terms of how you apply for accommodations, whether it's the SAT or the ACT. Um, comparatively, it seems like it's much easier uh, you know, to get ACT approval uh, than it is SAT approval, just even the timeline that's uh, necessary, right? So they direct you to the, you know, to College Board's website, for example, in case you didn't know, College Board runs SAT. ACT runs ACT, so that's, um, but check out this website if you're really interested in the nitty gritties of how you actually go through the application process. You're gonna find this, I think, to be extremely helpful understood.org. These guys are great. All right, but getting back to, um, getting back to here, let's see. So this is the actual page that you, that you go to in terms of um, how, to, um, how to apply within the College Board. So the documentation guidelines are, are laid out for us here. And this is also a great chance for us to kind of get a peek at what accommodations are available. Um, and I think Jazz touched on a few of these. Extended time is the most common one. And we talked about this before. It's usually what it is, is time and a half. And just to be clear about that, uh, what that means is that if you had an hour to complete something, uh, your young person might have an hour and a half, so an additional uh, extended time. Now, extended time sounds like a great thing, and it generally is, especially with the ACT. Um, but it can also be to your detriment. So it's really important for, you know, for us to know each, you know, to know our kids individually, as opposed to say, you know, extended time is great for all ADHD kids, right? Or extended time is really great for all, you know. It, uh, the point I'm trying to, to make is that if, if your young person tends to be impulsive and they tend to, to be inclined to work toward being the first one done, the extended time is not always such a great um, service to them. And it, it requires a certain amount of coaching and working with that student to learn to understand how to make use of that, that, that time extension. And um, that's, a, that's a, probably a longer topic that I want to be able to cover in an upcoming event. All right. So um, when they expect, you know, when they're requesting extra time, the documentation has to show that there's a, an identified disability and that the student has difficulty taking tests under time conditions. Now that might not be, that could be for a couple of reasons. Let me just cover that. Um, it could be a processing disorder, uh, possibly slow processing situation, which is very common. And so this extended time is great um, for, um, for those kind of kids. It could also be a remedy for addressing anxiety. 
And so we've been successful in various staffing settings in schools, that sort of thing, to, uh, to, uh, to land an accommodation around time extensions for kids who feel a, a, um, a heightened sense of anxiety based on the um, sort of the constraints of having a timeline. So just something to consider as to whether or not that might be relevant to your young person. Just to see if I can go back here. All right, before I go too deeply into the different types of accommodations, I definitely want to swing back to that in just a second. I do want to just point out that if we go back to this page here, I also have the contacting the ACT link for you here for you to be able to see and provide your documentation. And again, what that often looks like is um, your counselor providing some um, verification that accommodations are being used in the class. Right? So I wanted to really point out this one because if you happen to be watching this video right now, you might be like, Mike, you're only talking about people in schools. Well, what if you're homeschooled, right? So here it is right here. So we can, we have a specific part of the page that's set up just for you guys, right? So if you, you're looking for the process uh, in terms of how to request accommodations directly from your home, right? That without the affiliation of a school, that's how you do it. And it's all set up for us, which is great. Great to see that. So, um, okay. Let's go just quickly back to different types of accommodations. I think that's what we want to talk about next. It's probably a good time, again, maybe to pause for just a second in case you have any questions or you have any thoughts. Okay, so we talked a little about how to access accommodations at school, how to navigate the request for accommodations which is easier than ever um, in, in a lot of ways, but uh, uh, it's, these new websites are set up to really receive that, that information. But let's talk a little bit about what the criteria is. There's seven basic criteria. The diagnosis is clearly stated. So again, if you have a clinical evaluation, that diagnosis is going to be, you know, will be identified inside that, um, uh, inside that document. The information has to be current. So if the diagnosis, it was from second grade, which we often come across this, well, oftentimes, Parents um, will uh, we will meet a family or we'll meet a young person who has a diagnosis, but the the paperwork and documentation is from elementary school. That can be updated. So I just want to give you guys a heads up. If you've already spent a significant amount of money um, on a clinical evaluation, such as a neuropsych evaluation, that kind of thing, especially if it's a private evaluator, oftentimes those same places, if you circle back to them, will give you an updated evaluation at a discounted rate. So I want to just, in case you were thinking, I'd love to do that, but I don't want to endure that cost again. Most clinicians will work with you on the price point, um, you know, as a, let's just call it a returning customer discount kind of thing. And if they don't, just ask them, <laughs> you know, that's, I think that, that could be helpful too. Um, so information needs to be current. So uh, we've got developmental or educational or medical history, and that's in, inside a, an evaluation that all that stuff would be included inside the, um, uh, the report itself. Diagnosis is supported. The functional limitation is described, you know, so wh what is it specifically that is challenging? So if, um, if, a, if we, let's just say we make a request for a scribe, right? Or, or some voice to text technology. We have to be able to show that the, the learning challenge is, um, you know, it's directly related to the request that you're making. Otherwise it won't be approved. Um, and it, like I just said, your recommendation accommodations are justified and they're justified through that verification process of um, getting feedback from teachers. And then finally, the evaluator's professional credentials are established, right? So we'll probably look for a PhD here, right? But generally speaking, um, a qualified learning specialist. Okay. That's some criteria. All right. So the next thing I just wanted to just kind of touch upon was the idea of you know how do I how do I coach a, a, a young person who has accommodations? It looks like we have some extra time, so I'll go into this a little bit, right? So this idea of you know how do I prep a kid? Like how would my test prep look different? You know, look differently if I had accommodations. Right, something to consider. 
Well, I would hope that if I was working with a young person uh, in, in uh, SAT or ACT prep, then I'd be very much acutely aware of their learning challenge and what their specific accommodation is going to be. To help the student get the best, uh, the best idea as possible of what the setting is going to look like, what the scope and the format of the test will be, and I know that's a big part of, of the work that, that we do, um, um, and helping them understand the nuances of where the accommodation is going to show up, and what are sort of the sort of the pitfalls of the accommodation itself. Where can it get a little bit clunky? I referenced this a little bit earlier. Um, many of the same young people who have an extended time accommodation are also the same people who are inclined to, to speed through the test, not self-check, not sort of regulate themselves in that way. Uh, the new online version has an ability to, I don't know if you're, if those of you who have done um, SAT or ACT coaching in the past, probably you've taught your students to create a, a pencil system for marking questions that are appropriate to maybe go back to, or you know, just give it another go if, to, if time would allow, or or to say this, you know, this question is way too chunky. I'm coming back to this one, right? It's going to take me some time to focus on this one. There's a there's a method inside this new uh, uh, the new online test to tag things. It has like a little like a orange tag button, and you can click on it, and it'll identify the um, it, it, you you know it'll allow you to identify the question as something that you want to go back to. Um, the other thing I want to mention too is that you know those of us who are working with highly skilled, high-performing young people in regard to uh, building their stamina or helping them have techniques for um, what I like to refer to as like when you swing, you know, in baseball, when you swing two bats before you go up to the plate, perhaps maybe some of us, right, um, is taking on some of those more difficult questions in the early part of the time, as opposed to maybe sometimes. Um, Sometimes we find our young people, they sort of exhaust themselves with the quote unquote easier questions at the beginning of the test. And um, so this new, the, the new version does still allow, even though it's not pencil and paper for the most part, it does still allow for students to, to bop around. You know, you could start with number 20 if you wanted to. You start with, you know what I mean? You can, you can move yourself within the test. You can skip questions and go back to them. So it's not... Um, uh, it's not a situation where if you skip a uh, question, you can't go back to it. So I just want to kind of uh, put that out there. And that is, you know, exactly what we're hoping our young people are doing. So those of us who have extended time, we're hoping, A, that it's going to get you to a place where you can complete every question. That's a win right there. B, give, us a, give our, our, our kids uh, a chance to effectively go back and take a second look at those questions that really deserve a second look, not to second guess, right? Not to change the correct answer to an incorrect answer, but to have a, you know, an effective system by which uh, we're going to identify certain types of questions that would require, or that would, you know, that would benefit from a second look. Um, you know, other, other techniques that we're working on in terms of strategies with our young people and, and, and how they use their accommodations in the test are strategies for focus, strategies for time management. Uh, we referenced earlier, and it can be really helpful to have an analog clock, uh, a watch. You know, um, ideally, the watch would have such a it would have such a, a band that could be bent and could just sit at the uh, in front of the student uh, so that they can they can keep an eye on that watch. Um, many of our students will set their, their watches to the top of the hour, not necessarily to the actual time, but maybe even to the top of the hour, maybe to the start at one o'clock, just as the, as the test begins, for example, to use that to help them in managing their time. We create systems where, and I'm sure you guys do too, if, uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you're, you're watching right now, um, whereas we have certain uh, segmentations of the allotted test time, where if we reach a certain point in that time, that's the time where we're going to circle back uh, and um, and correct any any answers that that need further attention. Um, also, techniques for managing time in the sense of like even if I have extended time and I'm getting to the end of the test, I still have ten more questions to go. How do I handle that? Right? How, how do I handle that 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 situation? Um, earlier, we talked about 
before, you know, in terms of before the test, it's like, you know, setting our kids up for success, making sure they have what they need, make sure they're, they're clear where they're going, that kind of thing. Kids tend to think they know things that they don't always know. So don't tell the kids, ask them questions. Hey, it's really great. Um, I, you know, I, I get this feeling you're already doing well on your SAT test. You could say that kind of stuff to your kids. You know, I, I, you know I, I'm really proud of you for all the work that you put in uh, to your coursework, as well as the preparation you know, efforts that you put into being ready for this test. Really proud of you. Uh, what do you know about the test so far? Uh, uh, what, what do you know about its location? What do you know about being ready for the test? You can ask kids questions like that. It could help them sort of regulate themselves and get clear on what the expectations will be so that we can avoid, you know, screaming out the door on Saturday morning, you know, trying to be on time. Um, and, and, and like I said earlier, um, understanding the, that there are pros and cons of extended time and that um, needs to be um, not overlooked. It's not... I think it, it's not safe to presume that simply because I have extra time that I know what to do with it or how to use it. Um, so, um, stress management and visualization techniques are another big part of the, the work that we often do. And that is just you know, supporting students in having a, a visualization, almost a mantra, a story that we tell ourselves about visualizing ourselves, walking down the hall, approaching the room, you know, and having these almost uh, metaphoric ideas about being able to access information through these imaginary file cabinets that exist right there in the room with us. There's a, there's a whole um, process that we go through with our students around visualizing success for test taking. Um, and then finally, you know, it's, it's all of the great uh, instruction that uh, whoever you're choosing to partner with in regard to your test preparations um, of identifying, you know, soft spots in our experience. Um, I will say one more thing about the test, and that is that is this: when I first uh, was was approached by my mentor to learn how to teach the, uh, you know, to, uh, to to coach the SAT and ACT, I said, I don't know if I really want to get involved in all this hype around this big test is this one day kind of thing. But what I've come to realize is that this is an incredible opportunity for young people to get comfortable with a culture of testing. And I just want to say this, I live up in the mountains of Colorado and um, I volunteer once a week at our local high school. And I, and I meet young men every week who come to my table and I help them get their grades kind of sorted out is what I do, I meet with them individually. And, you know, there's so many of these young people that have this misconception that if they choose not to go to college, that that, that is a technique for avoiding this culture of testing. And I'm on this mission to help students understand is take the SAT, do your very best, look, you know, find out what's, uh, you know, what's, what's possible for you, you know. Um, I'm helping kids get ready for the summer, right? And uh, we're talking about opportunities for the summer or, you know, jobs, internships, that kind of thing, you know. And I, I'll see kids just sort of dismiss the idea before they even apply. And I just trying to help kids understand, you know, you apply and then you decide, <laughs> you know, get yourself out there, take the test, immerse yourself and, you know, be brave and find out what it is you don't like, like face the fact that you don't really know how to use a semicolon, you know? Like face that fact, you know, finally master systems of equations, like really get how that works. You know, these kinds of skills are gonna have applications later on. Getting back to my point about testing, if you, you're, if you choose to go a military route, all your, rank, all your ranking is gonna be based on the tests that you take. If you tend to, you know, if you wanna go to automotive industry or, or welding or, or, you know, trade, you're going, to, you're going to have to take certification tests that are going to support you in progressing and, quite frankly, accessing pay increases. Yeah, Kevin, sorry. Oh, sorry, did I raise my hand? Yeah. I, <laughs> I didn't mean to. It was a high five. Um, but anyway, I, you know, I'm just kind of trying to bring things to, you know, together for because, you know, I feel like there's still this sort of culture of, you know, I don't know if we're going to really take the test or not. Uh, and, I, and I just want to really encourage you as parents, if, if that's who you are, 
um, to encourage your kids to give it a go, especially you know if it's required by the school. I, there's there was a culture a few years back of of parents sort of exempting their kids from in school testing, and I, I you know I may have supported that for a short time, but I I don't anymore. I think it's really important for uh, our kids to uh, to have this testing experience and to know that that's what's you know that's what's ahead. Um, I'm gonna just take a minute to take a look at some of the questions because I didn't have my chat open a little while ago. I think these questions are from my friends, aren't they? Yeah. So I have a couple that I can just read to you, Michael. Yeah, that's great. Uh, the specific documents that people should be collecting in order to support their request for accommodations, whether that's for a 504 and IEP, which I presume it would be. Yeah. Um, in advance of the SAT, ACT accommodations, what do they need? You, you spoke about going to a GP and a, a neuropsych person for testing. And so what are you asking for? What, what are they diagnosing? Well, so let's just uh, entertain a couple of different scenarios. So if I am a student who's been identified with a 504, I already have accommodations. I have a legal document that I can present. That's, that's, that would certainly suffice. Um, if in the process, of landing accommodations, a clinical evaluation like we discussed earlier, um, specifically from a neuropsych evaluator would be really helpful. So that's yeah. if you are applying for an IEP and a 504, you want you need something in advance to take to your school official to yeah. get the accommodations at the school. And then if I understood correctly earlier, those accommodations that you get through the school are the same accommodations you essentially would be be asking for from either college board or ACT. Right, right. right. Okay. Uh, there's no guarantee that they're going to honor them, but for the most part, they do. You know, I think you, you pretty much can count on that. And I just want to, you know, make it clear too, because you may have just recently landed the evaluation and you might be thinking, well, Mike said we have to wait. You don't have to wait. I mean, you can bring the evaluation to your counselor and see if they'll advocate for, uh, for you. As we said earlier, it doesn't seem to be a duration requirement any longer. It just needs to be evidence, you know, or verification from the teacher that they are indeed using the accommodations in class. Um, also want to really reinforce the idea that just in case you don't know, 504s and IEPs uh, will, will travel across states. And so, you know, that's the other reason that we really encourage families to, you know, to go the extra mile to move out of the MTSS process and to get those 504s because MTSS uh, multi-tiered uh, str uh, strategic systems are really set up, uh, support systems, sorry, are really set up as a sort of a, a just a, a mutual agreement between uh, a, a teaching team. And none of that will carry if you happen to need to leave the district or you leave town or you move to another state or if there's a long-term sub, et cetera, et cetera. So landing these, these accommodations can be really helpful. And so my point is, if you just recently moved, that doesn't mean your accommodations aren't uh, aren't valid, right? They're they're valid within the United States, uh, in any any state. Um, so next question that we have is, um, sorry, oh, how long is the timeline? So we we spoke about this earlier. So with with uh, College Board SAT needs usually needs materials like six or seven weeks in advance of a test date. With ACT, it looks like they've trimmed that down to 10 days after the late deadline. So they need to receive the material material from your school official by those times. But if you're a homeschooler and your student's not yet on a 504 or IEP plan, maybe you have a sophomore, you have a junior in high school, how long do you think that process will take to, one, get the, the documentation necessary and to submit what you need to submit to college board or ACT? I think um, the answer, the answer and that's a great question. I think the answer to that is if you're going for the formal documentation process, it could be anywhere from six weeks to a, a year um, before that, that all happens. But in the scenario you described, and I'm not promising this is going to work, but if I were homeschooling a, a young person and I needed to make sure these accommodations got secured, A, I would do my best to make sure there's some good lead time. But I, 
but there's one thing I've seen over and over again when it comes to interacting with uh, with school officials and school staff is that if there's a PhD behind a recommendation, they're likely to honor it. And so what I'm saying is, is that if you can legitimately, you know, convince and presuming you've had the long term relationship with your general practitioner or, or, or specialist or, you know, it could be, um, you know, uh, you know, so again, someone with a doctorate who can provide a written recommendation, I think that's going to carry. I really do. I think you're going to be in a, you're going to be in a much more strategic position. What we're always trying to, to avoid in our work as advocates for families is the perception that your kid really doesn't need support. You're just an overprotective parent or, or overconcerned parent, right? And so by sometimes by having that um, additional voice, whether it's a, uh, an advocate like ourselves or whether it's a, you know, a, a doctor, or a, a clinician, that kind of thing, it's gonna support your, you know, your position. We'd like to presume that in every school and every situation and, uh, that all the adults involved all want the same thing. They want kids to, um, to, to access what they need and to be able to show their best work, no matter what the setting is, right? But sometimes you run into, you know, conflictual situations, personalities, or that sort of thing. And so having a little extra support, again, whether that's a documented signed um, note from a doctor or an advocate sitting next to you at the meeting, that can really be an incredible asset to making these things happen. Michael, what is, so that's intriguing. What, you can hire an advocate to help you get accommodations yeah. or what? You said you're an advocate and you and Jazz are advocates. So what does that, what does that mean? How? Yeah, how does that work? Yeah. And how do I, I find you? You know, like, why do I need you? Yeah, and, how do I find you? More, more and more colleagues, um, you know, who are, who are available, you know, in this type of work. What's nice about advocacy these days is that it can be completely virtual. Um, and let me just describe how it works. Um, oftentimes people will contact us just to simply have a conversation about, you know, do we, you know, is it possible, do you think my child could use accommodations or could use some additional support at school? How do I go about making that happen? We'll often refer them uh, back to the school, like uh, as we discussed earlier, or if the, if the parents, if the family has the resources, we can direct them. Uh, we can we can refer them on directly to a clinician that will provide the evaluation. So we can be the the referral source. Um, the family will meet with that clinician over time. The, the evaluation will. Be, oftentimes, um, I will have had um, some contact with the uh, with the clinician. If not, the document can be shared to an advocate like myself by the parent. I would presume that all advocates are, would do what I would do, which is to scan the document very closely, annotate it, highlight it, making notes and reference points so that if there is a contentious part of the meeting that we can, we can refer directly back to the recommendations and the data points that are provided inside the, um, the evaluation. These evaluations, by the way, are anywhere between 25 and 40 pages um, uh, traditionally. So I, it takes some time for us to get through them, but, but it's an incredible part, uh, you know, incredibly powerful part of supporting any, um, you know, arguments that might come up. Now, when I say arguments, I don't mean, I don't mean to say that we have all that arguments in these settings, but there's two, um, there's two sort of ways of thinking when it comes to accommodations for kids. One is let's give a kid everything they could possibly need in, in, in support, right? The other part, uh, point of view is let's um, not give them, um, you know, um, any more than what they need, right? So oftentimes we can be in, in settings like this where maybe it's a review of a 504. And as soon as we sit down at the table, we could have a teacher or a, you know, administrator suggesting that we pull the time extension, for example, you know, and you just want to be mindful of that. And, uh, you know, it's, it can be blindsiding, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And so having an advocate for you in settings like that can really help to sort of bring everything back down to balance again. And, and, you know, and, and as a team, we get to decide, we get to discuss what, you know, what we all think would be best for the young person. But I'd say that that's the most contentious situations is when there's um, an administrator, for example, who has an agenda 
and that agenda is to trim trim the fat, um, you know, and um, that doesn't always serve kids and their family. I'll tell you who it does serve, though. It serves the district because every accommodation that gets peeled off the 504 helps them to be less at risk for being out of compliance. So that's something to be aware of. And again, um, something that an advocate can support you in. Advocates like myself will attend the meeting with you, uh, whether it's virtually or in person, we'll sit right next to you at the meeting or sit across the table from you, provide any documentation. We'll, we can pause the meeting for a minute and we can request to pause and clarify things. There's a lot of acronyms that get thrown around in these settings. Um, and it's important sometimes for parents to be advocated uh, to, you know, to have an advocate that can, that can explain what's being said. Um, sometimes there's some subtleties that are, that get expressed. For example, the, as I said before, every district wants to avoid litigious uh, situations. So they may make something appear to not be available when it may, or when it might be, or they may refrain from making a recommendation when it might be appropriate because they're concerned that it might put them at risk. So that's again, um, another reason that's, you know, helpful to have an advocate. For, so for, for the people I meet with, so there's um, generally a follow-up meeting that happens after the formal meeting so that we can debrief and discuss. Sometimes it happens walking out to the car uh, in the parking lot. Other times it's, uh, you know, just a, a, a formal uh, hour that we set up to go over the document and make sure everything's set. Um, the school is always responsible then for providing that documentation. And then we review that as it becomes available and um, make sure everything's in place. And always reminding parents that, you know, you are completely in charge of your, your child. If you um, make a request for accommodations or just make a request to, to um, explore whether or not they're eligible, you're not in any way surrendering your parental ability to call the shots for your kid. You know, make sure that that's really clear. And you can make changes to the 504 or the IEP at any time, anytime you want to request. A lot of parents think they have to wait till the next year's cycle in order to do that, but that is not the case. Mike, one more question came in, and that is, uh, how do you know when you need an advocate? Yeah, I would say you know you need an advocate when you're maybe a person who um, didn't like school yourself. Maybe just being in the building makes you uncomfortable. You know, for a lot of times when you go to meet uh, it, now, a lot of times these uh, the settings of these places are, you know, uh, for these meetings are in conference rooms, that kind of thing. But, you know, you could have a 504 meeting in a classroom and you find yourself sitting in a tiny desk in a tiny chair and it could bring back some some stuff for you. Right. So if, if you know you're triggered by your own school experience, you probably should, should get an advocate um, if you're finding that you're getting some pushback. You know, if you're finding that the, the teacher doesn't really seem to be in support of, um, you know, uh, uh, for some reason, right? If there's oh, that's some... interesting. So you, I guess, you're, you have to support the family because the school is not supporting the family to the degree that the family would like to be supported. Oftentimes it's a personality thing. This is what we're yeah. doing. Okay. And so we're just trying to present the facts and, and make it clear to the, uh, the folks that we need to move beyond that. And I think the third situation is oftentimes families have accommodations in place and they discover that they're not being met. Right. Uh, okay. Students advocating for themselves, teachers like, you know, you don't get extra time. Nobody gets extra time in my class. Okay. Well, then you probably need an advocate to support you and just making sure that the administration of the school understands that they're out of compliance. And you do that, and you want to do that as tactfully as possible, right? Could you bring in an attorney? Of course, and sometimes that's appropriate, but that's a little bit, you know, like, you know, using the chainsaw when you, all you need is a whittle knife. Yeah, you know what I mean? So, yeah. <laughs> I, wanted, I wanted to add that uh, the parents also may get you know head to head with their with their young person uh who doesn't want to be pointed out right has a hard time with this accommodation piece and doesn't want to be different in the classroom or maybe the teacher just shouts out you know go get your extra time over there or, or you know just doesn't know is not not handling it well so when you have a reluctant student a student that's anxious um can can look like um reluctance and that's a good time to get an advocate because part of the work that an advocate does, and Mike does this with every student as well, well, speak with them, talk to them about what's available to them, 
why this says what it says, how for them, how they can speak up. And most of the time, almost 100% of the time, the student is at, are at these meetings. They're speaking on their own behalf. So Mike prepares your student as well. And if that relationship is, is contentious, um, you know, let's ease that up so an advocate can support that for you. You mentioned that, Jessica, the most powerful voice at these meetings is the student. And if we can yes, prepare it effectively, um, then we're at a much better chance of getting the company. Need. Perfect. Um, I know we're just about out of time here and I just I have some friends that just came in and they need the room. So I'm going to wrap up, but I just want to let you know, be back again, like next week to talk with parents, just a little bit about how to get your kids back on track, you know, how to get your kids back. <laughs> yep. How to get your kids back and back on track. Mike's um, at our local library right now because he's going to see a student right after this. So he's going to transition. But really appreciate y'all being here and supporting um, your young person to have that level playing field, um, to help your relationship with your team, uh, to ease that up, have more peacefulness at home and get them exactly what they need to triumph and see their potential um, rise. And really appreciate you looking at all this. We're with Just Two Tutoring and TPAPT. Uh, look forward to talking with you soon. Thank you guys. That was terrific. Have a great have a great evening. Bye.